Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, that's much better. Too many of you is sitting in the back there trying to catch, catch, catch a few little Zs in between the, the talks. My name's John Bollinger. I did, in fact, invent Bollinger bands um, back in the early 1980s. Um, when um, I was working at the Financial News Network. Um, and it's oddly enough um, that that is, in fact, the genesis of my involvement in the cryptocurrency world. Um, at that time, in oh, the mid-1980s, we uh, um, were looking for some top-notch programmers to help us improve the, the content of our screens on, on, on air, you know, the boards and, and the technical indicators we displayed, the charts and, and all the information we displayed. And we hired a, 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 a young, a very, very bright, um, but totally, um, totally unpersonable programmer by the name of Bill Heaton. And uh, Bill was uh, um, a brilliant programmer, and he did really well for us. And I put it in the back of my mind that if I ever get, get involved in, in anything that needs programming, anything involving um, the networks or, or anything like that, internet was just uh, um, beginning to be thought about in those days, I would keep track of him. And so later on, a few years later, when uh, um, the web started to become a reality and we started to build some websites. Um, some of you may have visited them. Equity Trader um, was one. BollingerBands.com um, was another. Bollinger on Bollinger Bands. We had a, at the, toward, toward the end of that experience, we had six or eight websites. I hired Bill Heaton uh, um, to work as a programmer for us. And he, um, he set up our servers and, and he, he lived up in Seattle. And, and he literally, he set our servers up in a little cubby hole, a little light, like sort of a hideaway space underneath the staircase in his house. And uh, th that was sort of how you did it back in those days. And um, as we started to grow, we started to get a few more servers and we started to need a little bit more power and a little bit better connection to the internet. So we had to move from his house to um, a, a hotel that in um, downtown Seattle, it's called the Weston Building. It had been a hotel, but it had been converted entirely, the entire building had been converted to housing internet servers. And so he moved our servers there and set us all up in a rack and everything was lovely. We had great connectivity and it was, it was really a, a pretty terrific time. And I, I live and work in Los Angeles and I'd never seen our, our, our setup, so I decided to go up uh, and, and visit our setup and, and see it. So I walked up, it's on the, the 12th floor of the Western building, and, and you walk into this room, and it, if any of you had ever been in, in a server room, the first thing that strikes you when you walk in is it's loud. It's just a tremendously loud environment. It's all these fans that are blowing around trying to keep the servers cool. And in addition, there are these giant air conditioning ducts that are dumping cold air in, into the front of the server rack so that the cold air can be pulled through the server racks to keep the servers cold. So it's cold and it's loud. And you go in there and, they, and you walk up and, and there, there's a, we had uh, 10 machines at the time. They were li little slots and it, it was sort of fun to see them. But there was something really interesting going on in the rack next to it. The rack, the rack next to it, these are big tall racks. They're uh, eight foot tall or so. And the rack next to it, instead of like all the other racks in the room, which had lots and lots of small machines in it, the rack next to it had four huge machines in it. And I asked Bill what, what it was, and he said, oh, that's our Bitcoin miner. Those are our Bitcoin miners. And this was very, very early in the process. Bitcoin mining was just starting. I said, Bitcoin? What's that? And he tried to explain to me what a cryptocurrency was, and I didn't get it. I didn't get it at all. But these machines, I mean, these, these were really impressive machines. They were big, they were loud, they were consuming a huge amount of power. And I, I just went, what, what is it that they're doing? And he said, well, they're mining bitcoins. And I went, what's that? So I went home and I started studying up on cryptocurrencies. 
and I started to get involved in, 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 in the cryptocurrency world as it started to develop, I really thought that there was something very important going on and that over the years we should really pay attention. Um, and it, 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 it turned out that was right. And uh, so I've sort of been watching um, Bitcoin from the beginning uh, or, or relatively, relatively near the beginning. I've only gotten really active um, in terms of trading and being involved in, in, in the cryptocurrency world in the past two years. Um, and I, um, I've done really well um, in um, my trading activities with, um, with um, the cryptocurrencies. And the reason is, is that the cryptocurrencies seem really amenable to technical analysis. They, they really seem to um, to, to follow the basic concepts, the basic precepts of technical analysis really well. They do nice accumulations. They trend really well. Um, the patterns that they build um, are very easy to understand and interpret. And there, there seem to be yeah. so, so, sort of information central for, for um, uh, the Bitcoin world is, is Twitter. There are many people on Twitter that are involved and they, they do a lot of um, talking back and forth about all of the different trends in, in, in Bitcoin. And, and there's been a very, very long sort of battle going on. There, there are these groups of, one, one group of people, very strident, they say, no, 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 in cryptocurrency, it's only fundamental analysis. You can't you know, technical analysis doesn't work and unless you understand all of the fundamentals and, and, and such, stay away, it, you just keep, you, you can't make a living. And then over here, on the other side of, of, of Twitter, throwing back at them, there are these people say, no, 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 it's impossible to understand all that stuff. It's all insiders, it's all craziness. The only thing that you can do is look at price and use technical analysis in trade. And so this battle has been going on 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 Twitter for years now. Now, of course, it's never going to be one on either side. Either sides, both sides are convinced um, that they are correct. I happen to fall on the side um, that uh, technical analysis, and specifically Bollinger Bands and the Bollinger Band tools, um, work very well um, in the crypto world. And there are a lot of people um, out there in the in, in, in the Twitterverse and, and, and in, the, in the crypto world um, that seem, seem to agree with me. So we're going to talk a little bit today about um, what Bollinger Bands are. I, I do provide a very short introduction and I'll provide some examples of what's been going on in, um, in, in, with Bollinger Bands and the cryptocurrencies. I'll, I'll show you some, a couple of trade setups and such like that. And I'll talk about pushing technical analysis further into the crypto world with other sorts of technical analysis techniques. And then I'll, I'll end up with a little bit about where I think we're going in terms of the future here. So um, just in case uh, um, um, some of you don't know what Bollinger Bands are in order to not just blow by you and, and, and think that this is magic. I have a few slides here to describe um, what Bollinger Bands are and how they work. So Bollinger Bands are a type of trading band, which is gen generally we're talking about intervals that are drawn on charts above and below uh, a level in price. Uh, there, there are many kinds of trading bands. There are percentage trading bands, Bollinger Bands, Keltner Bands, Donchian Bands, so on and so forth. They go, go, go on ad infinitum, but they all do basically the same thing. They all provide a definition of whether price is relatively high or relatively low. So by definition, when you, if, if price rises and touches a, a upper trading band, price is relatively high. By definition, if price falls and tags the lower band, price is relatively low. We can use that information, those, those relative definitions of high and low, to do pattern trading. We can, we can use it to detect W bottoms, three pushes to a high, uh, and, and such like that. We can also um, use that to compare the action of price in relation to the action of other technical indicators. Um, typically, um, these are volume indicators or some indicators that uh, um, get some sense of the supply and demand characteristics of the underlying security. 
Um, we talk about accumulation, distribution, supply, demand. So th these uh, um, indicators are very helpful in, in that regard. So it's generally, in, in, in terms of trading bands in general, we're talking about uh, you know, a relative definition of high and low that helps you identify patterns and, and, and can help you interpret the price action in relation to the action of indicators. So this, is, this isn't sort of like, um, uh, you know, oh, gee, I think it's going up, or oh, gee, I think it's going down. This is a very rigorous process of looking for technical analysis facts to support an argument. Um, I taught, taught a class this morning, and one of the things we did is we looked at a, a W bottom that had occurred in the spiders, the SPY, um, uh, a year and a half ago or so. And we built up slowly over, over the course of a couple of hours five or six different technical analysis arguments all related to bands and indicators to help define that W bottom and where we should enter and how much we should risk on that trade and what the potential of that trade was. So it's, this is quite a rigorous process. It's not um, the sort of, you know, oh, gee, I'm, 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 I'm bullish on crypto, so let's buy some cryptos. So Bollinger Bands are a technical analysis tool that combined a sense of trend. It's that middle band. Um, which, we, we, which we set to define the intermediate term trend and a sense of volatility to delineate trading opportunities. For trend, we use a moving average, typically a 20-day moving average or 20-hour moving average. Um, depends on the, on the bars that you use. Um, these, for the purposes of this talk, a bar could be anything from five minutes um, or even a minute for, for a currency that, that, that's very, very active all the way out to weekly bars or something like that for, for very long-term view of the market. So we're going to always going to talk about bars, not specific time um, periods. So we, for, for our measure of trend, we use a 20-period moving average. Um, and we take uh, um, that moving average. If it's rising, by definition, the trend is up. Uh, we take the moving average. If it's falling, by definition, the trend is down. So you can see what we're doing is we're building up a set of definitions whether the price is relatively high or relatively low, whether the trend is up or the trend is down. We're going to keep on doing things like that so we can come to rigorous trading decisions and, and excise the emotions from the trading process. That's really the, the, the core of what we want to get done here. So for volatility, we use a, a, a mathematical calculation called population standard deviation. We use this calculation because it is very sensitive to the outliers. So if we've been in a narrow trading range and all of a sudden we start trending up, as price starts to deviate from that moving average, the bands will adopt very quickly and they'll keep our definition of price being relatively high or relatively low germane to the trading process. And that's very important. Um, and of all the measures of volatility we've used, Standard uh, looked at standard deviation has the greatest sensitivity to outliers, so it makes it makes the bands the most adaptive they can be, and that's why Bollinger bands tend to work as well as they do. So here's the here's the uh, um, the formulas for sta for Bollinger bands. Oh, everybody always wants to know the formulas. You know, the software all calculates this stuff for you, but nonetheless, you know, somebody comes up invariably comes up and says, "But you didn't give the formulas." Well. Here's the formulas. So volatility is standard deviation, population standard deviation of the close. The middle band is an average of the close. The same data, we always use the same exact data for the volatility calculation and for the moving average. So if, it's, if, we, if we're doing hourly bars, then it's um, 21 hour bars for the average and 21 hour bars for the standard deviation. So the upper Bollinger Band is the middle band plus some variable, usually two um, times volatility. And the lower band is that middle band minus some variable, again, usually two um, for the volatility. And, and the defaults are n of 20, or a calculation length of 20. And Bollinger Bands are plus or minus two standard deviations spread above and below that moving average. So there are two important Bollinger Band indicators that help us in our trading process. Um, the first is called percent B. 
it tells us where we are in relation to the Bollinger Bands. So uh, the formula for percent B is on the bottom of the slide there. I'm not going to go through that, but um, uh, for, for simplicity's sake, it is the same calculation as, it's, as, as uh, stochastic. Many of you are familiar with the technical indicator of stochastic. All that we've done is take the periodic high and the periodic low inside the stochastic calculation and substituted them with, for the upper and lower Bollinger Band. So it, this works out. Um, this indicator is 1 when we're at the upper band, and it's uh, 0 when we're at the lower band. It's 0.5 when we're at the middle band. If we're outside of the upper band, it's a number greater than 1. If we're beneath the lower band, it's a number less than 1. The second indicator that we use in terms of Bollinger Bands measures how wide the, the bands are. And this is called bandwidth. And it's simply the distance from the upper band to the lower band. And we normalize it by dividing by the value of the middle band. Bandwidth is the key to trading the squeeze and the bulge, which are uh, Bollinger Band concepts that allow you to identify the beginnings and ends of trends. A squeeze is. Uh, uh, basically where, where trends are born, and a bulge is where trends go to die. So a squeeze is a periodic low in bandwidth. We say it's a, uh, if bandwidth is the lowest that it's been in, in 125 bars, that's a squeeze. If bandwidth is the highest that it has been in 125 bars, that is a bulge. That's the, that's the background um, materials. So we have um, a relative definition of high and low, the bands themselves, an indicator that tells us um, how high or low we are, and another indicator that tells us how wide the interval between high and low is. So I'm going to do a classic Bollinger Band example here, and we're going to look at two patterns. We're going to look at a W bottom. And we're going to look at an M top. And so these are patterns literally in the same shape as the capital letter. So a W bottom, we're going to come down. Slice, we're going to make a low. We're going to have a rally back. We're going to come down and retest that low. And then we're going to have a rally afterwards. So the pattern is in the sh shape of a capital letter W. An M top is exactly the opposite. We come make a high in the market, pull back, come make a new high in the market, and, and then a decline occurs. So it's, it's a pattern in the shape of the capital letter M. Um, so a key here is that um, in Bollinger Band terms, a W bottom is a new low in price that is not a new low in relation to the Bollinger Band. So that's how we define that opportunity. And the M top is exactly the opposite. An M top is a new high in price that is not a new high in relation to the Bollinger Bands. So this is from the middle of 2017. Um, and this was you know, what convinced me that I ought to be really serious about trading Bitcoin with Bollinger Bands. So we have over here a beautiful W bottom. We come up, we make a high, we pull back, we make the first low. It's outside the lower band. We rally back and we make a new low in price that is not a new low in relation to the band. And I'll point this out on the other side of the room as, as well for those of you who can't see it over, over here. So the, one of the ways we, we tell what's going on is we can confirm that because percent B is much lower on the first side of the formation than it is on the right-hand side of the formation. So this is a classic Bollinger Band W bottom. It's a new low in price that is not a new low in relation to the Bollinger Bands. For those of you on this side of the room, we're talking about this pattern here. It's a new low in price in the shape of a capital letter W. That is not a new low in terms of the Bollinger Bands. So I, was, uh, I had been active on Twitter at this stage of the game for about six months, um, mostly questioning people about various aspects of of trading Bitcoin in, in those days in 2017, it was actually hard to get going. Um, 
to trade cryptocurrencies. The, the exchanges weren't, uh, that we have today weren't up and running. It wasn't easy to get fiat or currency, dollars and, or pounds or yen, whatever, in, into and out of um, the cryptocurrency markets. So I've been questioning a, a lot of people trying to find out how to best and in, in most economically and most efficiently um, trade these things. And so I went on, uh, on, on Twitter as a way of saying thank you for all the information um, that had been given me. I went on Twitter and pointed out this setup exactly as it was happening. And um, I went from, uh, and then you know this, this rally ensued, and I went from having about 5,000 followers to having like 30,000 followers in the space of a couple of months because people started to realize that there was real value out there to this sort of technical approach in the cryptocurrencies. Lo and behold, we come up to the top here and we make the exact opposite formation in terms of the top. We make an M type top where the high we make a new high in price that is not a new high in relation to the Bollinger Bands, and we get a giant downturn. And I treat that up as it goes along. And by now, people are reasonably um, convinced that these, this, this sort of technical analysis approach works well in the crypto markets. And there's a lot of interest now, and there's a lot of dialogue going with people starting to exchange ideas about how to trade and, and, and what patterns are, are what. And so in this period that somebody first introduces me the, to the idea of using 240 minute bars or four hour bars, and four hour bars really, really work well in the cryptocurrency market. This my, my two choices are daily, daily bars and 240 minute um, bars in the crypto in, in the crypto market. So why do Bollinger Bands work so well in crypto? Well, one reason is crypto is a form of pairs trading, and pairs exhibit a statistical property called stationarity. And it means that things that are based on, on calculations like standard deviation, variance, and, and, and such like that are well suited to analyzing this sort of data. So pairs trading involves having two simultaneous positions, one long and one short. For example, if you're long Bitcoin, you're long Bitcoin and short the US dollar. And here's some examples of, of classic pairs trading. Long Apple, short IBM, that's long new technology, short old technology. Um, long consumer staples versus consumer cyclicals. Um, long large stocks versus small stocks, that's SPY, IJR. Um, long, um, Growth versus short value, uh, long gold versus short silver, long the British pound, um, short the US dollar. That's called cable because the information used to come um, under, by cable under the Atlantic. Um, and then, of course, the, one of the classic ones uh, is, um, the, we call it the crack spread. It's long crude, short gasoline, and heating oil. That's been destroyed by modern technology, by modern column fractionators, um, so that th this doesn't have any uh, meaning anymore. But for a long time, it was a classic, um, it was a classic pairs trade. So pairs are special, their, distribu their statistical distributions are unique in the securities world, whereas Normal securities data is not normally distributed. Pairs are normally distributed. So they work very well with, with tools like Bollinger Bands. Um, they exhibit stationarity. It means they, they, they have good, they, good mean reversion tools and make some excellent vehicles for certain types of technical analysis. So the, the hottest topic in Bollinger Bands are squeezes and bulges. Squeezes are where trends are born. Bulges are where trends go to die. A, Squeeze is a periodic low in bandwidth. It bulge is a periodic peak in bandwidth. So a squeeze marks a beginning, and a bulge marks an end. A squeeze is where trends are born, and a bulge is where trends go to die. So this is an example just from this past February. February, um, I write a Bollinger Band letter once a month. It's got um, four. Um, you know, weekly updates in between. So I published this chart in the Bollinger Band letter because I, I did a whole piece talking about how wedges and pennants and other technical formations like that are actually just forms of squeezes and they're really volatility trades. So I posted this chart saying, look at this. Here we have 
in the ether um, versus the US dollar using a 240 minute chart um, bar chart. We have this wedge building and it's really a squeeze trade and you really ought to pay attention. So this, I published this chart uh, I, based on Friday data. Uh, the newsletter was published on Saturday and this is what Monday looked like. So you got an immediate lift out of there so this is why we focus on squeezes and bulges in, in this market. Here's the squeeze. You can see it's a periodic low in bandwidth and the bulge, to, it's the end of the uptrend. So again, for those people on this side of the room, here's the squeeze, here's the, the rally that comes out of it and there's the, here's the squeeze down here and here's the bulge. So. The last thing I want to talk to you about, I've got a young woman here waving telling me that I'm out of time, is the latest sort of analysis that I've been working on in, in these cryptocurrencies is inner coin analysis. Those of you who have worked with technical analysis um, in the stock market know that we have inner market analysis. We compare how different markets work together to, to get an edge. Well, we can do this in crypto as well. Um, so I'm going to show you a chart here. This is a, a classic setup. It's in the upper left-hand corner. It's Bitcoin. And you see the Bitcoin comes down to that line and trades sideways. And then meanwhile, all the other coins beneath it is Litecoin, LTC. To the right of it is Ether, um, ETH. And um, to the right of that is BCH, um, Bitcash. So they all break support, but Bitcoin refuses to break support. So you have all of this evidence telling you that Bitcoin's going to go down, but Bitcoin's going sideways and everybody's saying, no, 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 Bitcoin's going to go up. But you, because you are looking at intercoin analysis, know that the resolution of this sideways, whoops, of this, ah, how do I go back, 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 back. You know that the resolution of this sideways pattern in Bitcoin is going to be down because all these other currencies have already broken support and are already trending down. So th we're doing a lot of work on this intercoin analysis. I've only been looking at it for about two months now. It seems like it's a gold mine of information and um, I think it's going to be a terrific idea going forward. So I, I just answered one last question on my way out the door. Everybody says, well, Bollinger Band's 35 years old. How come they're still working? Right? Bollinger Band's 35 years old. How come they're still working? Right? So first of all, Bollinger Bands are a, not a system. They are a set of tools. Right? So you can build many different systems out of them. If they were a system, they would have been arbitraged out of existence, but they're not. They're a set of tools. And they touch first principles of the markets, and you cannot arbitrage away a first principle of a market. They touch volatility. Um, and the, the usage of Bollinger Bands is widely varied. That, everybody uses them in a different way. So that's how Bollinger Bands have been able to stay functional for as long as they have, and they work as well today as they worked when I invented them 35 years ago. So thank you very much for spending some time with me today.